Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. What's up?、Right? And welcome to Social Jello with Angelo. Today, I'm here with Philip. And Philip, if you've seen my show before, you know I'm notorious for butchering last names. Sometimes even first names. Hey, that's, that's very c a t c h y Campbell of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just go after that name and just throw it out. I'm going to, okay, here, I'm going to try. j e l i n a s That's pretty close. That's pretty、okay. close. <laughs> What's the actual well, no, pronunciation? It's kind of funny because, well, the pronunciation I've been told is j e l i n a But I, I know that,、uh, you know, somebody said, yes, but there's,、um, a, there, there's some stuff.、Sort of, um, see, it's, what, it's kind of when you go back to find out the history of, of your name or the history of where your family supposedly came from. Because in the, I guess we all came over on the boat from Europe at some point. And the problem is that, like, for example, In the 1500s, the Spanish were kicking out anybody who was Jewish from、uh, Spain. And I was told at one time that, well, we had a Jewish family connection. Well, who knows, right? And then other people say, oh, no, no, there's a statue with the name Jelina in, in、um, what's it called, Czechoslovakia. So realistically, unless you do one of those 23andMe things, you're never going to really know where you're from. And even then, it could have been somebody that you don't even realize. Who was representing that? Like, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's like the, the, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of people who are born on the wrong side of the bed sheet, so we say. You know? So, <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, people are, you know, I remember that,、um, what's it called?、Uh, um, Genghis Khan, you know, he wanted to, he had, he had sex with like thousands of women. Yeah. yeah. And I, back then, they're told, I'm told that he is, you know, the descendants that he has number. In, you know, there's an actual real percentage, like eight or nine percent of the people in Europe or in, in, in Asia can, be, can、uh, trace their lineage back to Genghis Khan. Who knows? But it's like, you know,、uh, it, uh, it, it, it brings up a lot of possibilities. So, <laughs> <laughs> well,、um, Philip, just to、uh, kind of let people know who you are. Um, you know, I know you through the Kaja Kembo circles,、um, and I know you also run the Kaja Kembo family tree. For those listeners that don't know what Kaja Kembo is, it's a, it's a martial art founded in Hawaii, and it's a mixed martial art. And in particular, Philip, you run, or I, I, I forget like where you are at now, but I know you're in Canada and you're running an academy, or you were running an academy. What's, what's going on with you right now, I guess? Okay, I've been, I've been running a school of some sort. Since about,、um, I guess,、uh, 1979, 1980. And、uh, I got my black belt in 75 in k a j u k e m b o I had a black belt in something called Japanese k e m p o before that. But,、uh, you know, people say, you know, I mean, I've had people tell me that, well, you know, he really wasn't a black belt. So、uh, who knows? So I, I know that my legitimate ranking that was supposedly verified by C. Joe before he passed was. In 1975. So that's where my first certificate came from. And he signed my certificate. God only knows. I've seen lots of certificates signed by him. And they're for people that I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust to, to bring a five bucks over across the street. So, you know, the reality is that, you know, it, it's probably, the, the, it's probably the, the art that represents truly human, human interaction because,、uh, you, you know, you shouldn't trust, you know, like when you shake somebody's hand, you shouldn't have to count your fingers to see if they're all there. Anyway, so、uh, I, I, started in, in, I started martial arts in 1967. I had,、uh, where I lived, I, my, my father had bought me some、uh, black belt magazines. And in 1964, there was a Canadian guy by the name of Doug Rogers who had gone to Tokyo. And that was the first year that the、uh, Olympics had judo. And he finished a、uh, silver medal behind the Japanese guy. And it was amazing because it was like, it, it, it was like you had that sense of, hey, if you're a Canadian, you can actually do it. And so he had,、uh, what he had done, he, he had actually, where, where my school was until like the、uh, beginning of July, was right around the corner from where he had 
started he had started at the downtown YMCA, which is uh, on Stanley Street in in uh, Montreal. And then he'd also trained at a place called Rennie Lalonde Judo and Karate, which is down the street. And then I think he got his, his initial degree or first couple of years a degree, and then he moved to Japan. And he studied with that guy, uh, Kimura, actually, the guy, the well-known Kimura of the Gracie clan. And uh, there's actually a, uh, a black and white film of Kimura that was sponsored by the National Film Board of Canada about him. And he would, you know, he's, I remember reading stories that he would, he would hang himself for half an hour a day and, you know, do thousands of push-ups. And the guy was just amazing. And anyway, he was teaching a university uh, group, and uh, you know, so they basically filmed him doing that. And then, so 67, 68, 69, I was still going to high school. I, I joined my high school wrestling team uh, in the summer. I did some judo at a local uh, community center. And then uh, in 1969, my family moved into Montreal. And I, at that time, I was doing something called uh, Chitori, which is a Japanese karate style. Chito Ryu is actually a very famous style that that actually um, got a lot of its popularity in Hawaii. Uh, the uh, the Chitosi, uh, Dr. Chitosi, who was the founder of this art, you know, like I, you know, he, he uh, had been, or most of his students had been Hawaiian. So uh, it's kind of like the same, I, same idea, I guess, of uh, Funakoshi, so Kenneth Funakoshi becoming a, or having a Kajigembo black belt and then you know, basically being recruited by the, the Shorokan people to basically take on the mantle of his family's art and becoming a Shorokan practitioner. But uh, anyway, so that's sort of where I came from. And in, in 1970, um, I, I graduated high school. I, uh, I met, I'd, a guy I met in, or I'd, I'd known in high school, had met this Kajikembo instructor had, who had moved to Montreal. Now, a lot of people, refer to, you know, they, it's kind of funny because in, in Kajigembo, you know, we have a lot of guys who, full, who, who fought in the mil, who fought for the military and did a lot of stuff and, you know, fought in Vietnam. Did all that stuff. My teacher was one of those other guys who, who basically didn't fight so much in the, you know, to go to Hawaii or to go to, uh, to Vietnam, he fought to not go to Vietnam. And so what happened is he was this like 115, 120 pound Filipino kid. And he had a very feminine looking face. So, you know, a tiny guy like this, he wasn't, he wasn't gay or anything like that. Uh, but he, at the same time, if you look back at, at the way, um, what's it called? Uh, if you look at the back of the way, you know, units try to process people. You get 30 people in a platoon and, and the drill instructor would be there and you'd be there for the next three months with this guy. So they would have a choice. They could spend three months trying to get unit uh, integrity and all that kind of stuff. Or they could pick one person and say, okay, I'm going to shit on this guy and we're going to basically give, he's going to be a throwaway and, you know, and, but everybody's going to, you know, get together to beat this guy up. So the drill instructor was basically picking on my instructor all this time. And so one day my instructor got really pissed off and beat the living crap out of the drill instructor. The only problem is you can't do that in the military. If you do that in the military, they get angry and they put you, well, if you're in the Navy, they put you in the brig, but they put you, they put you in some kind of jail. So my instructor deciding that he didn't like the thought of going to jail. He went up to Vancouver, which is North of, uh, you know, he was in California at that time. And uh, he went North and uh, went to Vancouver and uh, he rapidly found out in Vancouver, you do not tan, you rust because uh, they have a lot of rain there. And so he came east to Montreal and he set up a shop in Montreal and uh, he started teaching, you know, he, he taught all the wrong people uh, and uh, we found him out and, uh, you know, he, he became our instructor and he passed, he actually, uh, he passed away. He, we died in 1994. He was actually shot a few times. So you can see that his life, his life was, you know, he, he was a very nice guy in, in his interactions with us, but he lived on the edge. Anyway, so that was that was my background initially with Kedrick Campbell. Uh, I met Cedro Prado in 1975. He was brought up, uh, my instructor, had a big tournament in Montreal. And uh, so we were there doing that. And so uh, anyway, so 
C. Joe Imperato came up and saved the debt. And then later on, my instructor kind of like in 1980, he kind of closed his hands, which means in the, in the whole, in the Chinese uh, tradition, you don't know, you're no longer interested in teaching. So I, I got involved uh, uh, in 1981, I got involved with uh, Filipino martial arts in a system called Piquiti Tercia with my, uh, with a guy named Leo Gahe, Tuan Leo Gahe. And he uh, was teaching and, and so I went down to, I'd gone down and read about it in a, in a, a flyer I'd received one night. And I said, okay, so I said, oh, it's interesting. So I took a train down to uh, New York or New York State and uh, to a place called, uh, well, just this the train station before Albany. And then I took a bus inland to a place called Oneonta. And this is where we had the, the seminar. And uh, so at the end of the weekend, I could hardly walk. It was amazing. And so I wanted to do that. So. Uh, at that time, I met uh, Eric Knaus, who was uh, and Tom Pizio and Billy McGrath and all these guys who are, you know, were mainstays of that system. And uh, I started, yeah, I'm a real historical buff. You know, my, I mean, my my family kind of, um, we, I knew exactly where my family and my mother's family anyway, came from and when they came, you know, what, what part of England they came from, where they where they stopped doing it, where they did this, where, you know, where they, you know, their address, where they lived in 1805, that type of thing. So history was a very normal part of my, my stuff. And so it was like, oh, okay. So I would just read about history in, in Hawaii and history, you know, the, the things that would happen. And you'd read about Hawaii, how the whole the Filipinos came to North America and they would be here and they'd be there. And so it, it was a very normal thing for me to do. And then about, uh, you know, I'm in meeting Eric Knaus. I uh, also, uh, a few years later, when um, he had moved to California and I moved and I connected up with, with I'd met uh, Guru Nisanto, Guru Dan Nisanto at the same time. And uh, in 1990, he asked me to be a member of his instructors association. So I said, well, just a second, I, I, I thank you very much, but I, I'm not really, in, you know, if you do that, if you just say yes to everybody, you know, every smiling face that comes along, it really kind of alienates the people who think that they're your instructors. So they don't mind if you go somewhere else. They just mind if you don't ask their permission. So I asked their permission and they said, yeah, yeah, okay, sure, no problem. You know, Dan Nassano is a good, good name. Okay. So uh, after about, uh, I was with him from about to, well, I'm still with him. I mean, I, I've had, I've sponsored him for about 33 seminars in Montreal. Last year, gonna, we didn't. Have, uh, I'm, I'm going to pause you real quick here. Okay. Uh, just, just for the listeners that don't know <laughs> who Dan Inosanto is. I'm ho I'm, I'm sure mo most of the Kaja Kembo people listening are really excited right now, but there might be some people that are, you know, maybe have no, no idea what martial arts is or have a broad idea yeah. what it is. Uh, would you mind explaining who Dan Inosanto is real quick? Well, Dan Inosanto was originally a black belt with Ed Parker, but in 1964, he was chosen by Ed Parker to be Bruce Lee's um, gopher, if you will. His, uh, and he would be the guy that would be um, bringing Bruce Lee everywhere, including to the tournament in, in Long Beach, at which Ed Parker sponsored every year for many, many years until he passed away. And uh, so Dan Inosanto met Bruce Lee, became a very good friend of his, and then Bruce Lee also moved to Los Angeles at the same time. And Dan Inosanto became his instructor. That was 1967, I believe. And so, um, yeah, so I, you know, Bruce Lee passed away in 1973, but Dan Inosanto um, had, you know, I, I met him in 1981 because he had come to, uh, I'd been a, a member of a tournament in New York in 1981, or yeah, a few months in October of 81, I'd started doing Cali in June. And I'd gone there and it was kind of funny because you don't understand what it's like to do a Filipino cultural day slash tournament. Most people don't have this idea that, you know, well, you're, you're just doing the tournament. And no, 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 no. Filipinos love three things. They love eating, they love singing, and they love fighting. And so the tournament would go on, but you know, they, but they also had, you know, it was a cultural event. So therefore they had about six or seven choral groups 
They had all these people who were uh, into uh, fashion shows and stuff like that. So they had to go. So we had myself and two other people were supposed to fight for the first, second, and third place. And I hadn't lost and the other two people hadn't lost. But they just decided arbitrarily, because, you know, we weren't Filipino, that, oh, well, we're going to just get, you're the, how long have you been doing this? Six months? Okay. So you're third place. How you been doing this? Two years? Okay. Well, you're second place. And how long, oh, you've been doing this for four years? Okay. You're first place. And that's how they gave up the tournament. It was like, well, anyway, so, uh, but Dan Inosanto was our head judge at that tournament. And I got to know him a bit. And then the next year we were in Big Spring, Texas during a Christmas event. And Guerrero and Asanto came down and had about four or five of the students with him. And so I got to know him a little bit better. And then um, I started going to some, you know, around the same time he started giving seminars. You know, he wasn't giving seminars. He was a, a high school teacher in California. And uh, so he just did that. And uh, so what happened was that uh, he uh, he was going to do a few seminars because he had had such a great demand because of his association with Bruce Lee. And so what happened is that uh, when he decided to try and go back to reintegrate himself into the high school like um, the teaching group, uh, group, he found out that, uh, well, you know, the guy who had let him do this was not he, he hadn't done it properly. And so as a result, Dan and Asanto could go back into teaching, but if he went to the bottom of the uh, the seniority pile, which meant that he would have the crappiest jobs, because he'd already had 25, 30 years experience by that time, but he'd have to go to the bottom of the, the pile. And so, like, and so he decided that, well, in for a nickel, in for a dime, in for whatever, in a dollar, a dime, whatever it is. It just, he, he just realized after a while that it, this was not meant to be that he would go back. And so he started teaching and um, very rapidly, he, you know, he went from, you know, like basically, you know, most of us are happy to get like four or five seminar requests a year. He had so many that, you know, he, he actually, his wife had to, you know, do this almost full time. You know, she would book his flights, book him into places. And, uh, you know, so, you know, he, he actually, you know, if you were to find out how much he made, you would think, wow, this guy can make uh, a tidy, a tidy bit of cash at the end of the year, uh, just by, you know, just by people wanting to do that. And there, he, he leaves on Friday afternoon, he gets to the place where he's going, and then he teaches for two five hour days. Uh, and he'll either come back on the Sunday night or the Monday morning. And, you know, so he'll spend four days in Los Angeles at his school on Ocean Boulevard. And uh, the rest of the time, he just goes off to that seminars and he's, uh, you know, 50, 50 out of the year. Like, I don't, basically, I think that he spends Christmas at home because he hasn't got any choice because no one will want him to do a seminar. He is, he is completely, like, focused on that. You know, he, he does a seminar thing. But he was my, he, so I started going out. He started going, doing a lot of seminars. And we started having instructor uh, weekends at his academy in Los Angeles. And so I would be invited. Um, actually, it was very funny because when I was down when I was when I would visit him, I have a friend of mine named Bob Reich who was a, a high-ranking guy. Well, actually, he wasn't a high-ranking guy. He was a, a long-time guy in Yoshinryu, which is the jujitsu system that, or in Danzonryu, which is a jujitsu system that um, that was practiced by most of the Kajukenpo practitioners. But most people don't realize that or didn't realize that, and it, it came out. It was also practiced under different names: Yoshinryu, whatever Ryu, this, whatever. and but. You know, when um, when uh, Professor Okazaki passed away in 1951, it was like, you know, like a lot of people, you know, would say, well, you know, they, they didn't want what he knew. But like his, you know, there's certain things that you do if you're Japanese that are, should we say that, that aren't not necessarily, they're not the best things for people to create lasting relationships. So he basically, you know, he basically what he did is, it, I mean, I guess it's been, it's been, he's been dead for like 68 years. So it's like, it's not going to be, it's not like his, his life is going to be over because, you know, he, but, uh, but what he did is he kind of moved his, 
his mistress into the into the back house of the garden, or he moved removed his interest his mistress into the house, and his wife was in the back house. So when she got to beat him up, or when she got when he passed away, and she, and she inherited everything, if she basically kicked it and she threw all of this stuff away. As a matter of fact, um, a couple of the the founders of Kaji Kimball, I think uh, Joe Hulk, drove by and asked, you know, wow. You know, he saw all this junk and said, you know, a lot of he, the reason he had a lot of the photographs and uh, the historical memorabilia was the fact that uh, he was there. Uh, he, he drove by and he asked, you know, and she was going, yeah, get rid of you. Take it out. I can't, I can't stand looking at it. So, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of funny things. But that's kind of made me do this Kajigembo family tree. I I was this guy in Montreal and there was Hawaii and Hawaiian stuff in it. You know, I would go to California and you'd see the names. You're like, I'd expect, I drove down to California the first time in 1974. And I was like, I, I went literally, I, we drove from Montreal down to Chicago, Chicago West to something or other. And then we went down to Colorado and then we went over and then up to San Francisco. And when we crossed over the border, I got out of the car in the first rest stop we were at and looked in the yellow pages to see if there were any Kajigembo schools, which is exactly, you know, I thought that's what you did, right? And so there, there weren't any, and uh, I was very impressed. And so uh, my um, uh, one of our seniors, had, when Roy Buchanan had been down and I was visiting Rick Alamany, who our instructor had talked about often. So we weren't, it's very hard to know whether or not people actually connected with, you know, with it, because a lot of times people would, you'd kind of welcome him to your house and he, they would stay with you for six months or eight months or a year or whatever. And then they'd go and then you wouldn't really know if they had any connection to what you were doing. And so that's that's kind of what, what happened. And so uh, we went down, we, I, I uh, but, I was kind of rebuffed because I, I, I was on. I used to do these tours with these rock and roll bands, and one time I was in uh, San Francisco, and we were in this uh, late seventies, and it was uh, Genesis. We were doing something at Bill Graham's Winterland, and right up the street was Jeff Wong's Catch Gamble School. So I, the, we were there for two nights. So I said, "Well, screw this. I'm not trying to be here for two nights." Uh, you know, I'm, it's if I come back after the show, because it was basically I was running the uh, T-shirt sales. I went up and trained with them and then went back and it was like, uh, uh, you know, like, OK, whatever. And uh, so that's you start realizing that, that this is this is kind of catch gimbal. It's like this widely, you know, it's much more organized now than it ever was before. But before it was really, really like you couldn't tell one day to the next if there were all the guys from the Gaylord group and did you like them or did you hate them? And there was all the guys from the, the Costco's group. Did you like them or did you hate them? And so all the groups, I mean, I see that you have Alan Abad's uh, crest behind you. So yeah, I'm, yeah. Sure, I'm sure that, you know, when he was down in San Diego area, did you, uh, did you like, you know, did he like you? Or did he hate you? You know? So there was like, there was like a whole lot of things. I mean, like there was a bunch of stuff, you know, uh, you know, Phil Dang, you know, I, I, mean, I have no idea what the history is, but, you know, uh, Alan Abad's wife to, <laughs> continues to not like him. And I have, you know, I have no reason to know why, but it's like, uh, okay, you know, but it's a, it just goes to show you that there's a, you know, some memories are longer than they're deep, you know, so what can I say? So, but that's, a, you know, that's what Catch Gamble was. So I, what I tried to do with the, the family tree, I started in 1988 and with C.J. Amparado's okay, I sent all these letters out to everybody and I got like a few back and everybody was, of course, everyone, hey, bro, what you doing? What you want, man? What you want? And so in 1977, actually, I came back, I was in Japan. It was my very first time in Japan. I was on tour with this band called Tees. And we were, uh, we had done um, Nagoya, Fukuoka, Fu uh, Fuoka. Tokyo, Nagoya, Fukuoka, and, uh, to uh, and Kyoto. So we did like a four, four seminar date. And on our way back, we, we basically took an airplane, you know, whatever to get there. But on the way back, it was like, okay, so most of this stuff was going to be shipped back. Most of the, the our gear was going to be shipped back. And so, 
we were told that, well, you only have to be there back. You have to be there to pick up the gear in, uh, in two weeks. So I said, okay. So they gave us our tickets and said, whatever you want. And so basically we had, we could go Montreal, Vancouver, or we go from Hawaii to or like Tokyo to Hawaii to Montreal to Vancouver to Vancouver to Montreal or you know any other variables, and then they said, but the fact is we could go to Hawaii, and so we went to Hawaii. And my stand up myself and this other guy, we stopped in Hawaii and we went there. And then um, the Pacific Coast Highway, I met, uh, um, I met uh, what's his name? Um, it was one of uh, you know, George Iverson. I, George Iverson, I met George Iverson and a lot of his guys. Uh, and, you know, the, it, you know, I I may have even met uh, Kylie at that time. I really, I don't remember. But, you know, it was like, it was like, a, things were like, you do stuff, you know, they go, I, my wife made me make sure I went to see uh, Don Ho and I watched him sing Tiny Bubbles. There, there was some connection. I said, okay, great. I did it. I did, you know, so. Anyway, so it was, uh, it was an interesting time. I've actually been back to Japan. Um, I, I, since I did Kaiju Kimbo, I, in some, from 2010, I've been back at least once a year. So it's, uh, you know, Japan is really awesome. I, 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 there's the guys in, in uh, Tokyo called the Shinkali Group. They're probably uh, the, the Japanese version. Well, they, they used to be the Japanese version of, uh, of, the, of the PTK uh, Kelly group in Japan and but then uh, there's another group um, with Satoshi uh, Satoshi uh, uh, who um, uh, he, he basically broke away and became part he went under uh, group uh, to Bill McGrath and so you know it's like life goes on and you know kind of like Hawaii it's kind of funny because when you hear about Kaji Gimbal and people fighting with each other, you know, like I remember hearing stories about the, you know, like in Hawaii, in Kajikimbo, you had people who are cops and you had people who are criminals, you know, like in, like in, in Hawaii, you had people who grew the marijuana in the mountains and you had the cops who were trying to stop them growing the marijuana in the mountains. So it was like, a, it was, it was kind of amusing, you know, because, uh, you know, you, you, depending on who you knew, it would depend on what you knew so so it was kind of funny so but i i that's what i decided i, I need to i need to get something i figured that i was the best one to do it because i didn't know any of these people personally so i mean because the thing the problem in hawaii is that you know if you live in oahu okay then you have the guys on the north shore now it's only like 15 20 minutes right to drive over there but it's like going into different ganglands, you know. It's like it's like going in East LA. It's like huge, you know. There are all these places you could go on this street and this street, and then our buddies are over here on that street and that street. But it's like that's what it was. So, you know, so um, but with with Imperato, Sidro Imperato, he was. We had a we had a, a couple of meetings in in Hawaii and in Maui. So it was, uh, George Kananas. Uh, uh, he had an association with a, 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 a small camp, uh, like a hotel thing, and we went there a couple of times in, in the nineties. And so, so, but it it really enabled me to start doing it. And now, now it's like people really want to be on the family tree because at the first time it was, hey bro, what you want? What you want, bro? You see, you want you want beef? You want beef? No, I don't want beef. So what, what, what's this uh, you're telling me about the uh, family tree? You know Hana? You know Hana? Yeah, yeah, I know Hana. You want beef? No, 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 I don't. You know, this is what you would you're dealing with. It was almost like you were trying to steal their their uh, their um, this, this, this spirit. Their, <laughs> like uh, no, actually, I'm, all I'm trying to do is find out about. Catch gamble people like, like that, and it was all, it was pretty funny. But it was a, but it's, it's slowly it's getting to the point now where people are actually seeking me out, you know, because it, it's funny because I think most people get very frustrated, and I and I I can see that because I like I had been very frustrated early on because you go in there and you know, I'd been I'd run, bump into people, you know, and they they would talk to me and go, oh, yeah, yeah, well, oh yeah, okay, and you'd spend hours and hours and hours 
telling them what you're doing. And they'll go, yeah, that sounds really great. And then they would basically, as soon as you walked out of there, they'd tear up your card and they'd throw it away. And it, I, I mean, fortunately, I didn't live, you know, the problem is like, like if you live in, in Colorado where the Picasso school people are, or you live in Texas where, you know, uh, they have the, the, the uh, Hill Reyes that has a certain outgrouping, or you have your Northern California and North of, 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 of San, San Francisco, you have all those guys. You have all these things happening. You go, wow, this is really amazing. But then you realize they all despise each other, or at least they, 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 they try to. And, and, you know, like they, they're, to, they're really nice to each other's face, but there's like really a lot of like or animosity. But it took a, it took a while and then uh, but slowly but surely, you know, people, people are getting to a point where they're going, you know, it's like, it's not like well, they've been ripped off so many times by so many people that I think that they just get to the point where they go, I'd rather beat you up now more, you know, hey, bro, I'd rather beat you up now and know that I got you beat up rather than find out in two minutes, in two or two year, two or three years that you're going to rip me off anyway. So it just takes them a long time. So, uh, but now, now it seems to, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because now it's like, it's not what I wanted. I, you know, the thing that the idea was never to create a situation where people were like, oh, you know, you're the family tree, take care. It's like, no, I'm the guy who just cares enough about history to spell your name right. And once I spell your name right and I put it there, you know, I got a lot of time people will say, well, you know, I gave you my name, I gave my name and I never, you know, I said, yeah, but you, you, you know, sometimes people put the wrong names and sometimes people put them backwards and sometimes they, they, the guy, the guy's name is Jerry and they call him Gordon. And sometimes, they, you know, they, 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 you know, and it's, it's tough because a lot of people will say, well, you know, I got my black belt and, uh, you know, and they, they tell you here. And I said, well, you know, I actually have, I spoke to that te your teacher and he told, you know, he told me that under no circumstances should I put your name on the tree. <laughs> And it's like, oh, uh, and then he says, whoa. Oh. And sometimes, sometimes they have legitimate reasons, like he slept with their wife and stuff like that. But other times it's, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's, it's, there's just no real reason why. And there's all these guys will come up and say, yeah, yeah, I didn't want to do this. But I guess one of the, one of the things that, you know, I'm finding now is like a lot of the Hawaiians, like the, you know, the, I, I remember Guru Asano telling me a story about uh, Blaisdell Auditorium in San, in uh, San Diego or in, in Honolulu. And he was saying about how, he told me two stories that were kind of funny. One was that uh, once the Filipino women of Hawaii were sponsoring this international women's group um, um, event and they so they you know the, the the local women were supposed to put on a luncheon, uh, do something, and then they were supposed to showcase some of the local fight uh, not fights but local um, sparring or not um, sports. You know, they, like for example, you know, you come to the United States and you you see baseball and football, and you go to you go to uh, France and you eat soccer and you know and something else. So and then you go here and you'd see these things. So these local Filipino women, uh, you know, so they, they would put pants in and then adobo and then you know, like all that stuff. He said, oh, right now, How, what quaint food, yes. And then they would have, um, then for the sports, they would have these two guys come out and kick the living crap out of each other with sticks. And, you know, it would be like, and everybody was like, oh, and he said, oh, it's, it's, all fun. it's okay. It's not, it's not swords. They're not hurting each other badly. <laughs> it's like, but they've got these rattan, or you know, they have either rattan canes or bahi canes, you know. And it's like, you know, they, uh, I remember C. Juan Parado talking to me and saying, you know, oh, we used to we used to cut down a two by four, and I'm going, yeah, okay, you know, because I I saw some of the stuff that they did, and you know, I mean, you, you know, as a as a Cali guy, he was a great Kempo man. So, but you know, just goes to show you, there's a you know, everything changes. Everything changes. It's like, it's interesting because you realize, uh, you know, I, I'm starting to realize that Kedge Gamble has an awful lot of Cali in it, 
um, there's a, a depending on who you learned it from, because like like um, there are a lot of guys who you know like uh, depending on who who was the, the receiver of it, they they kind of um, they they prepped it back or they they prepared it you know like a like a, a dish of food and they would you know for example if you gave a piece of beef to a, a Filipino you'd get some kind of adobo or or some pancit you know like whatever you gave it to a Japanese person they would come back in a bowl with some other stuff and some soup and some noodles you gave it to an American guy it would come back as a steak you come back you give it to a, a Spanish guy it would come back as a like a a, a con carne type of thing so like everybody would try to spe specialize in what they did and you start realizing that there's an awful lot of Filipino boxing technique in that you know I, I started learning um, there was a guy well one of the guys that got involved with um, with us doing Filipino martial arts was a guy named Vince Black he was a grandmaster uh, he was a student of this guy Johnny Gaspang and he learned in San Diego area and um, he was in National City, actually. And so, uh, but I, I had learned, you know, I I was learning stuff. I, you know, I, you know, I'd be like, okay, whatever, you know, like Alda Costco's going, well, great, we'll do him. And oh, you know, this guy, okay, we'll do him. And so, but then when I started seeing the stuff from this guy, Johnny Gaspang, you could see the knife techniques because I'd done, I started doing that stuff about seven or eight years after I'd been doing the, the Filipino martial arts. Because, you know, like you're going like uppercuts and blocks and punches like this. And you realize that that represents a very particular social you know, uh, situation. It's like it's it's the way the Okinawans have interpreted this material. And that's how they do it. And then 26, they went to Japan and then it was introduced to Japanese. And it was like there was this thing. And but the Hawaiians or the Filipinos. You know, the Hawaiians have lua, they have all that other art, and it's really amazing. And the, the Filipinos have, you know, they have, um, uh, they have, well, they have, they have whatever Cali, they have, they have the Cali Arnis and Escrima or wherever, whatever part of the province of the 7,000 islands that you think you come from, you can reinterpret that material that way. And so they have all this stuff, but you just realize after a while that, you know, the, the, there's a lot of flowing drills that work. That you know the same idea. Like if you're a boxer, you may jab, cross, and then hook, and the other guy goes parry, parry, and then bob and weave. So there's a bunch of stuff that you could get from that same material. And you know, like a lot of people say, well, you know, the Filipinos never had real boxing. You know, we have, you know, America had boxing. I said, yeah, yes, and no. And the reason I say that is because in 1898, the Americans took over from the Spanish through the uh, Treaty of Paris and they, they took over, they, they got uh, Puerto Rico, they got Cuba and they got the Philippines and there are a few other possessions, but those are the three primary ones. And they would, you know, they, people say, well, you know, well, where did they get it? Say, look, Americans, you know, if you look at pictures of boxers before the turn of the century, they all, their hands were kind of up here. You know, it's, it was almost like uh, an ability to withstand the other guy's punches before, you know, it was, it was very few, very few little parrying. Whereas because of the Filipinos, they would have their hands up because of the knives would extend. They would have the bacal grip and they would sort of like, they would parry and then do their stuff. And then, you know, when they would punch straight, there would be a slice and the knife could come across with the hooking part. So there was an awful lot of stuff that you'd see and you'd see the techniques and you go, how is it possible that you came up with these techniques? And so you realize after a while that, you know, America is a definitely, uh, you know, a, um, what's it called? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a multitude of, of, of spices. It's a multitude of, of parts that, that can come into it. And you start realizing that it's like, yeah, there are parts that it may not be a huge thing, but I mean, like, like if I'm standing here with, you know, doing John L. Sullivan stuff, getting punched in the face and punching you back in the face, eventually one of us is going to get a sore neck or fall down or lose a tooth or whatever. And so there's that whole idea of that. But it's, you know, you start realizing that some technical skills, some other aspects could possibly be developed 
under those circumstances. And so you start realizing after a while, I mean, I, I'm, I'm now putting an awful lot more Filipino techniques rather than Japanese techniques in the movements, not because I don't think that Japanese techniques work, it's just because I know the Filipino ones work. Because one of the one of the things we did that, uh, you know, um, I got involved with a group of uh, Filipino martial artists that was started by one of my teacher's other students, Eric Kanaus. He got together with Eric, our own Sanford and Mark Denny, and they created something called the Dog Brothers. And I was, uh, I guess you would um, would they say I was an original dog brother. I was there in 1988 and 1988. And, you know, it was funny because they invited about 30 people to come down to uh, the Los Ramos Park in uh, just north of um, San Clemente. And uh, they just, and he, well, seven of us showed up. So, you know, so everybody, oh, well, hey man, like people said, thought we were crazy. And so they, they just said, yeah, next time, maybe next time. And uh, then, then we got another uh, six or seven people or eight people. And so we had, uh, you know, they, they fleshed it out a bit. And now of course you can't keep people away with a stick. So it's uh, it's kind of good, but it's, uh, but it's so funny because the way we always did it, like when we first started, we didn't just come to this idea like, oh, we're gonna just wear a, a helmet. So Eric Knaus, you know, literally welded two fencing type helmets that were made out of um, mesh, you know, like a stainless steel mesh. And so he had made a, a circular part and like pushed, used a thing of press and pushed it in and, and welded it there. And then something going back here, like like basically like, uh, you know, patterned on the, the, the fencing helmets. And this guy, he just, he came there and he he did that. And then he put, uh, you know, he, he put, uh, foam on the inside so it would basically stay on your head and that's how we used to do uh, knife fighting and then you realize that you know after a while after a couple of years we realized that hey we don't need to do this we can we can actually use our skill to stop this stuff so oh, okay so but you know it's so funny now because now everybody goes yeah we use uh fencing headgear too and we do this i said yeah but you wouldn't have done this if you if you had your choice everybody would have been wearing like you know you look at you know not no no insult to the Filipinos, but the weak ass stuff is pretty lame. You know, it's like you wear this dress and you wear this helmet and you wear this cloak. And it's like, you have to see the video to see if you got hit because it's impossible to know. You got, you are, you're so well padded that there's no way on earth that you can even know. You know, and, and the thing is that most people, you know, most people, it's kind of funny because the, they would wear the, 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 the tunic uh, you know, with just the top button or the top thing tied. And so they would, so you'd, you would make it impossible for you to do a, like a whipping action across the, the stomach of the person because you'd, it would just, you'd basically tie up. And so the person wouldn't do that, even though it would work in a, to a regular person who didn't have that. So, you know, it's kind of funny when you, you see that, you know, there's all this stuff that, you know, I, mean, I, I don't put myself up there, but those are there's a lot of other guys, you know, like there's, you know, they, People, you know, they, they used to, you know, I remember Eric Knaus was saying, he said, because you'd always get hear these so many people that you'd always hear these guys who claim to have some sort of mastery in the Philippine martial arts. And they would say, ah, yes, but that would never work with against me. My baston, my baston is far too powerful for them to, for them to get, to, to, to stop me. And then, you know, like, so basically what they would do is Eric and uh, Armin, they would be there and they would have a stick ready. So, oh, you're ready, you wanna do it? Bang, and they would throw the stick down and they would say, okay, let, let's see. Because we used to have a lot of guys, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, this, you, is the, this is the gear you're talking about, right? So for the for the people yeah. listening, if you watch it on YouTube, I just pulled up the and gear he was mentioning. Really, he doesn't tie, see these things can be tied, but nobody ties them. And the reason <laughs> why nobody ties them is because you you know if you do a backhand and the person and you you get caught in their their trap their stuff guys whacking your head but I mean like they those are are heavy cages so, you know but uh, you know most of you know, a guy you know, I, I, sort of the better I remember uh, you know sometimes you'd fight these guys and they would basically have t-shirts and shorts a cup and a headgear on and no gloves and 
they, they would, you know, they would, they just, they were motivated, shall we say, to do stuff that, uh, yeah, awesome guys. But uh, yeah, so it, it's a, uh, it's actually it's very different because you, you, you know, even even though you try to do it, you know, you, the only way to actually find out if you're good enough is to do it. You know, people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just waiting to do it. I say, well, you know, I, I remember back in, back in the 80s, you know, the 80s, yeah, there was a, I, I was asked if I would, uh, there was a, a night International Catch Game Association tournament held in San Francisco, I think, or Oakland near the airport. And I was asked to handle the full contact stick fighting part. So I did. And uh, we had like four or five people who showed up because nobody else, you know, because we were doing a Dog Brothers thing and everybody goes, you know, all these guys were all weak half guys, they were all Dose Paris guys and going, yes, we're ready to do Dose Paris type sparring, but those guys are crazy. And so, you know, so we had we had this thing. And so the, the guys from uh, Melchor Chavez's school from Albuquerque showed up and they, they were willing to do it. And um, Arlen Sanford was there. He was part of, at that time, he was from Albuquerque. So he... Um, did it and there, so we had like five guys and then there's another guy who i know who i won't i won't embarrass him he's passed away now but i won't embarrass him or his family you know he'll say oh well, you know he, he sent a letter to these guys to the um, association at that time and said well you know i'm you know, tournament worked out okay i guess but if you want a real professional tournament call me next time and say yeah sure sure yeah we'll do that <laughs> <laughs> and then I think I found that's funny. I, so I just typed in Dog Brothers, and um, and your name actually came up. That's, <laughs> I I googled it and it, it happens. It happens. And it's and immediate and immediately. But this might I don't know. I don't. Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's another person. Because oh, it, it it has it's it says here. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna show you. I'm gonna bring it up real quick here. Here on a second. Let me okay. bring this here, and then you tell me if this looks familiar to you. <laughs> and I can't show too much. Is this is this, is this you? Is this? Oh God, you, yeah, I'm, on, I'm the guy on the right. The you go on the right. right. Okay, so for anybody, this happened, okay. last, this happened in 1919 or 2019 uh, at uh, in Sukijor, which is an island in the Philippines. Um, that that was a guy. The guy who was from India. His name is um, Heman. Heman, uh, yeah, Heman is his, his name. And but it was funny because. Um, I I didn't have any of my own equipment there. I, I wanted to show up, uh, but yeah, yeah, sixty year old dominates. Yeah, well, whatever. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, and I, I I can't show too much of it because I don't want YouTube to make a big deal. But I, you know, you're here, so hopefully YouTube. Has <laughs> to say. I'm not sure. I'm literally with the kind of video, but yeah, I just want to show people real quick what kind of. Uh, how the difference is between that gear that you were just talking about and how you're not really wearing much gear. Like it's mostly just a helmet. So you can feel the hits. Um, yeah. Well, going, the funny, going, it, it, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no it, it's funny. It's sometimes you forget to wear a cup because you wear so little. And then you realize it's only like when you get whacked across your thigh, really close to it, you go, Oh my God, I forgot the cup. <laughs> this oh. was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so much of a, it, it's a blunder. Definitely. But yeah, it's a, <laughs> But yeah, we, we learned we learned to do uh, you know, and it was funny because I I won a tournament in uh, nineteen eighty nine, and um, it was funny because we were in Nashville and it was like it was so humid because Nashville is is like in like most of Tennessee and Kentucky is a really humid place, and so Nashville, I hit the guy once and I literally the stick was it was so humid that the stick literally wrapped around his head. And hit myself on the hand with it. It was it was that it was that uh, humid uh, an event. But yeah, it was it was kind of funny. I, I mean, like, you, you sit there and you go like, well, they made us wear like body armor and stuff like that, like with, like catchers, you know, like kind of you know the the referee or the umpire's um, belly pad, and you go like, wow, what? And so it was, it was funny. So it was just like a lot of attacking, you know. I hit you as often as I can, and then because they invariably. When it comes down to judging, it, it's kind of like it's difficult to understand what the judging is because you you do you do it, but you you know most of I I like the dog brother thing of no judges, no uh, winners, no losers because when you when you have that, then who wants to you know 
you, you want the experience to learn. You don't really care about the experience to win because like if you win, you probably didn't do anything other than what you normally do to win. So if you have a, if you have something where, you know, you actually can learn, you know, like, okay, so I'm, I, I don't care if I win, I care if I can, if I'm trying to do this technique and the only way I can get this technique done is by running into the situation and, and you know, putting myself in the maelstrom and say, okay, I'm trying to do this technique, like, like uh, at number, number one slash, coming back with a number five thrust or a number eight thrust. So bang, so you're going, you go slash and then come back up. And you can't do that if you were worried about winning and losing. You can't, you have to, you have to see whether or not your, your timing is right. You, you, you just, you don't know, you have no clue. So the only way to find out is by checking it out. The only problem is that it's like, you know, uh, it's like I'm 68 years old now. So COVID has actually, it hasn't done anything bad to me, but it's, you know, it makes everything stiffer. I think, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I mean, because I used to train like four or five days a week. And then, you know, you'd be sitting there going, I remember at the beginning of COVID, like a year ago, last uh, last March, you'd run, you know, you know, at least you'd run. And then I would, there's a park. So I'd run and I'd, I'd have like a circuit I'd run. So I'd run and then I'd get to the park and I would stretch, I would swing up back and side and whatever. And then you realize after about five or six weeks or 10 weeks or whatever it is, that this isn't going to be over soon. So you start giving up little bits at a day, you know, so you, you go, oh, okay, well, you know, cause the thing is like, um, you know, my school was essentially shut down for, you know, for a year and a half. There's like people say, well, you know, I mean, we're very, very, very fortunate in Canada that we have, you know, like a lot of people go, that's socialism. So look, I'll take socialism as long as I can keep my school open. Thank you very much. You know, and uh, so we would have, you know, they would have this rent subsidy thing and they would they would start off with by paying, you know, like they would pay a third or a quarter of the rent and my, my, my landlord would pay a quarter and then I wouldn't have to do this and then, they have different things and sometimes you'd you know sometimes you'd survive and like I just moved because uh it just became it, it became untenable for me to try to support this uh you know I mean the at a certain point I mean I, yeah I was paying my rent the city the company or the country was supporting me but I wanted to reposition myself in the marketplace so I could actually do things and you know I, mean, I don't know what it's like down there but my gosh it's it sucks it's you know it sucks everywhere because you know basically what you have is you have a bunch of people who have never run anything before they've always just been the advertiser the advisors right but sometime this time they said okay you guys you tell us what to do because they've never had anything like this and so a lot of these guys uh, they didn't drop the ball but they they had no clue either <laughs> yeah no like you were mentioning how it is over here. So I'm in Japan, uh, for those of you who might not see the logo. And um, yeah, we... <laughs> <laughs> That's all I mean. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> so yeah, what um, in Japan, they haven't, you know, the Japanese are always about following rules. So they haven't, they only initiated a lockdown for two months, but still Japanese people follow the rules. So once they knew that COVID was a big problem, um, people just stopped going out. So if the government didn't tell them, hey, you can't go out. You can do whatever you want. But they just don't go out. It was really for about a year. Um, I did Zoom lessons, even though they were allowed to come in with masks, because they just don't go out. They're trying to follow the COVID protocol. So it goes back and forth between emergency declarations by the government where they don't lock us down, but they tell us that right now the hospital, the healthcare system is being strained. And mm -hmm. during those times, we don't get locked down, but people just self lock down. They just don't go out. So yesterday um, I cross train, right? I have my Kajukembo school. And then I also cross train with uh, Gracie Barra Jiu Jitsu. And um, when they go into these emergency declarations, what happens is it in house, the Gracie Barra Association will say, okay, we're only going to allow training pods so if you're vaccinated which i am um you know you can come in you can you can train 
but no cross training. So even though there's three different schools in three different cities, uh, you can only train with the people from that group, that city. You can't go into another city to go train. For example, I'm in, I train at Grisi Barra Kakogawa. I can't be going to Kobe to go train because I, I belong to that group and I can only train with that pod. So, and then even then, uh, I went to class yesterday and everyone was like, I'm not going to class. It was just me. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> me and the, and the head instructor. And he was telling me the same story. Like, I don't know how I'm going to keep, like, it's, it's rough trying to keep the school running. The guy started his school about two years before COVID. And I was telling him, you know, he was kind of um, new to all this. And uh, I walked in and at that point I've been teaching for about 10 years before. So either I came in and I told him I just want to train and I'll start as a white belt. Cause that's what, you know, I haven't trained with you and we'll, we'll do it that way. But um, he, in his time, I was talking to him yesterday and I said, you know, I know people that when I got my black belt opened their own schools and without COVID being an issue, running a school is not an easy thing to do. Like it's not, it's not people have all like a lot of ideas of how things are going to go and they run their own school, but it's not, it's difficult without COVID. It's difficult to run a school. It's difficult to pay the overhead if you're running an academy, it's difficult to get three different, it's just with Kaja Campbell, right? People from different schools, different ideas together to work together to run a school. Um, but then you add COVID to all that. And, you know, I just, I just, um, yeah, I just take my hats off to, to you folks having to deal with, with all that. Cause that's, it's rough. Like I said, in, and in Japan, they're allowed to do things, but people, like he said yesterday, no one showed up and he'll go through these, he was out, I'll show up here for weeks and no one will come, even though they can, because they're vaccinated with masks. But in Japan, they will self voluntarily just stay home. So well, yeah. I remember a little while ago, actually, not a while ago, I guess a year, a year ago, that's April, March, April. I had, I mean, literally, Guru Nasano was supposed to come in the weekend. Okay, it was at the 13th of uh, March, I think, that everything shut down, where they started announcing the fact that there was actually people wandering around the world and they were all from whatever. Anyway, so he was supposed to come in the weekend following. So all of all the people, so I had to cancel the seminar. I had to give back like twenty thousand dollars worth of, of of pre pre sale stuff, and then I kept getting you know like then I had, I had people who had, had not been to the school for six months, and their fathers were trying to you know, well you know he hasn't been there he you know you you should re refund him uh, six months and I said well no because he hasn't been here in six months, yeah but you know you 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 have to refund him and I said no I don't have to refund. Him. All I have to do is make sure that he can train when he wants to train. But, you know, you're, you, you, you have to, uh, you know, you have to realize, you know, the same thing. It's like, well, I'm more than willing to give money back for things like that. But if you're, when, if you, if you have taken classes and you've taken even one class and you had the expectation you were going to take all the classes, I'm supposed to sit there and go, oh, well, I'm supposed to read into it that you're not going to take all these classes. Well, it's not the way it works. I wish it was. It's a, but you know, it's the same thing. It, it, I actually, uh, I, uh, Stefan is a black belt in, uh, in um, Carlson Gracie Jiu Jitsu. I, I, I actually learned uh, my, my Jiu Jitsu. I got a brown belt so far in, uh, in Gracie in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that I got in 2004, but my my guy who uh, I, I I brought I sponsored the first black belt in Montreal a guy named Vagni Fabiano he was a Nelson Yale guy and he was actually he was a, a training partner of the guy who taught uh, oh what was his name the guy from Hawaii what was his name the guy from Hawaii. Um, uh, he, he won. A, he was a lightweight champion for years. So B J Penn. B J Penn, yeah. B because B J Penn was like his whole family is called B J Penn. But anyway, so he 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 trained with this guy Verissimo, and Verissimo was a, a a friend of this guy by uh, Vagni Fabiano. And you know, so I sponsored Vagni in Montreal, you know, for first a while, and it was fine. And then I found out on the internet that he was moving to Toronto to uh, teach. And I was like, yeah, okay, thanks very much. Not. And, um, you know, but then uh, I was approached by this guy named Fabio Holanda, and he basically did, said the same thing. And I, I, I made the mistake of going with him. And so we did, the, we had, you know, I was training. 
it was like maybe 98, 99. And so I was training a lot. And we had a lot of guys, we had a lot of MMA guys training with us. We had uh, Tour St. Pierre. We had, uh, um, what's his name? Well, we had uh, David Loiseau. We had, you know, all of the big guys from TriStar in Montreal. Even though they were Gracie Baja people, um, you know, anomaly, they, because they were also, also under John Danaher in New York, who was a, a, a um, Enzo Gracie guy. And, but, you know, they, but, you know, I mean, if you look at George St. Pierre stuff, it, it definitely wasn't a bottom game control game. It was top game, you know, crush, smash, bang, boom. So that's the kind of guy we had. And, uh, you know, so, but, you know, you just realize after a while that, you know, like most of these people are out for themselves. They're, they, they don't care. They, you know, they, it's like, they all talk about, oh, yeah, Brazil, we're, we talk very much about this stuff. He says, very good, you know? It's like, but we want, you know, basically, you know, they, they want to fuck you over, you know, because they, they, they want to take, you know, they figure that what you have being Canadian, they should have being Brazilian. And, you know, so um, my, actually my, my very first jujitsu experience was with Hicks and Gracie, or not Hicks and Gracie, but uh, Enzo, uh, no, Enzo Gracie, no, it was uh, Machado. It was uh, Higgins Machado. Uh, Mark Denny was training with him and he said, hey, why don't you come over? I'm taking a private with uh, Higgins Machado. So after about half an hour, he said, oh, I think I hurt myself. Here, Phil, you, you go in there. And he turned me into a pretzel. You know, it was like, it was funny because I'd never done this stuff. I I'd wrestled in high school, as I said, but I had I'd done a bit of judo, but I had no idea. And, and Brazilians you know, uh, and the thing that amazed me about Brazilians is that they knew what to do, but within literally within a year of the Americans, they were literally like this, and it was like getting to be this way. You know, like they, almost like having a blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu was almost a guarantee of winning an MMA match. Within a year, a year and a half, having a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu was no guarantee of win. It was uh, quite amazing the the change that uh, occurred. That was a uh, it was quite phenomenal. You know, I mean, sure there are you know there are guys like uh, 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 Spider Anderson. You know, uh, but you know the reality is that uh, you know those guys you know are you know, are unique people. It's kind of like saying, well, you know, you know Michael Jordan. You know, he was a pretty good basketball player. And he said, yeah, he was a pretty good basketball player. And he and he was you know. He could jump over you if you were standing there. Yes, that's what he could do. So it wasn't like he was trying to get into that basket. He was like, <laughs> it was like figuring out what what part of the uh, the court he would jump from and to nail you. You know. So, so and even say, then, like, it's so hard to compare the two. But basketball relatively hasn't changed much. Maybe a few small rule changes have changed a little bit of the sport. It's from Canada. Eh? It's from Canada. But like, <laughs> but, like, but like when you're talking about MMA, the learning curve is just so fast. Like the way yeah. people, the way from when the UFC started to where it is now, I was just talking to, to the, to the Brazilian and he, he's Japanese. And he was telling me about how, how, he watches MMA now. And he, it's like, it all looks like kickboxing to me. Now it used to be all be a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Now it looks like all that kickboxing. And I, and I was explaining to him like it's just the constant flow of the individual fighters and finding their niche, along with finding the weaknesses against. There's, I, I want to say that now. It, well, back in the day, you were strong at one thing, and that's you'd use that one thing to win. Now it's just being good at everything and finding what your opponent is weak at and going after that, which is why now you just see all kind a big mix of everything. And not, there's no longer that one, there's no longer stylists in the well, UFC. I think there's actually more stylists now because what happens really? is that you, you, because the thing is like, if you get a guy who's good at wrestling, good at kickboxing, good at like most of the other things that are considered necessary, he is able to win because Either he's more powerful, uh, you know, you look at uh, Nurmagomedov, whatever his name is, could uh, be Like he, he basically, he just went in and he used what he knew about wrestling to destroy Conor McGregor, and so he went and did. He just sort of said he was going to create a level of frustration in Conor McGregor so that 
know, Conor McGregor would go off and do stupid stuff and he would get caught. And then since then, since that, since that, since the, uh, Khabib beat the crap out of, uh, uh, of um, Conor, he's been beaten like half a dozen times. You know, it's like, it exposed him as being not the complete fighter. It's kind of like, you know, when, um, when uh, Matt Sarah beat George after uh, Matt Hughes beat him, it was like, oh, okay, everybody thought, because I mean, George, it was kind of funny because when George was training at school, it was kind of like, okay, you know, like he was, he was a fanboy. He had no idea that he would ever fight Matt Hughes. And when he got to fight Matt Hughes for the championship, it was almost like, you know, you could almost see like, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't literally do something against his, his, um, his, 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 not his boss, but the guy that who he respected so much. And so, you know, until when, when, when George sort of did the thing and, and uh, Matt did that counter and arm bar, you know, it was like, it was like almost like a stupid thing. And it was like, uh, and then George went back and beat him. And then I think the same thing happened when he fought Matt Serra, you know, and he was just like, he couldn't put his brain around, how would he, how do you beat up a guy who's half your size? You know, does that make you, because that's a part of uh, martial arts, you know, part of the, the martial arts, like, if you have a guy who's six foot six, does he beat up somebody who's five foot two? No, he, he doesn't because that's his thing, but you know, Matt Sarah would be, you know, he's like, you know, he, you know, because when George realized that nobody was on his side when he was champion, he he got down to business and beat up everybody, including Mike Bisping. But up to that point, you know, he was like, you know, he was, you know, he was a he was a tough guy. You know, it was actually very funny because my son works at Comic Con, and one year, I guess a couple of years ago, um, George was there in, um, he, he was, cause he'd done the Winter Soldier with the, uh, on, for, um, for uh, one of the Mattel movies. And he, and it was funny because uh, he said, oh, George, uh, my father is uh, Phil Rellina. And so he, he gave a nice shout out to me. It was like, well, wow. You know, cause it wasn't, you know, these guys, but one of the things I learned from working in rock and roll was that you know them, but you don't know them. Because they they're they're insulated by five layers of management and a couple of professional you know a couple of personal guys and and then their family and so they they will you know they they will surprise you I mean I remember we were on tour and one of the first tours I did was with Black Sabbath and everybody used to think you know nowadays people go Black Sabbath you work for Black Sabbath that's awesome I said look in 1977. Black, Black Sabbath wasn't the, the, the band that you wanted to work for. You wanted to work for Eric Clapton. You wanted to work for Genesis. You wanted to work for the Eagles. You wanted to work for somebody who's, you know, like, because it's not so much that they had hits on the radio, but it was more like, you know, most, peop most people who weren't like deadheads type of person, not deadheads, but, but it kind of makes you think of uh, Jerry Garcia, but people who are like, you know, not stoners would never have known, but it was, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, Tony Iommi with the guitarist for uh, Black Sabbath, I, went, I bought a jacket in, uh, oh, what's it called, in Portland, Oregon, because it was getting cold. So, uh, and then I was walking along and then Tony Iommi came over and said, oh, sir, you know, uh, hey, Phil, uh, I got this for you. And it was a, a, a can of a mink oil. And he said, you, it'll help, you know, you put this on your jacket, and it'll help it keep it longer. And it was like, you don't think these guys even know who you are. You mean, literally, you don't think they know who you are. But it's amazing. They, they, you know, they know exactly what's going on. And they, you know, I mean, it's, uh, if you're, I remember, <laughs> I was in Coconut Grove, California, and it was funny because Graham, one of the roadies, uh, asked me, you know, where well, you want to come out? Said, okay, so we went out. The car was driven by Ozzy Osbourne. So myself and four of the road crew and Ozzy were there. We went to this place called the Coconut Grove Lounge. Now, this is the blue haired set, right? This is like the white bucks and the, the dress and the, the curly and the white curls and everything. We had the best table in the house. 
it was Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons up on stage, literally, you know, like as close as the, this board is to me is where we were. And we were plied by the management with uh, zombies all night. And yes, I was shit faced drunk by the end of that night. <laughs> and uh, it was so funny because it was like, you just sort of, you realize that like, the things you don't expect to happen, happen. And the things you expect to happen never happen. So it's kind of a, it's kind of funny that way. You know, like when I, you know, when I, I mean, I wanted to go to Japan the first time, like I wanted to go to Japan right after high school and, you know, become uh, the next judo guy, even though you realize after a while, like, like the guys in Japan, like that guy, uh, uh, Shohei, who was like a really, you know, like the throwing machine over there. And you realize that this guy's been throwing people like that since he was eight years old. This is not like his thing that he doesn't sort of, he didn't say after high school, Oh, I'm going to go and do judo. So no, he, he, he was in a, in an accelerated program when he was like four years old and he was throwing people. And then, you know, and he's in the national team now. Okay. But you know, it's like, that's the thing you realize that they, you know, he just sort of does this stuff and he, he kind of go like this. And then when he decides to throw you, you have like literally a millisecond to decide what you're going to do. And if you don't do it, well, you're like all the other guys who gets thrown. <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's a bad, yeah, but, sure. but you just realize after a while, it's like, you know, that's, you know, so it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, when I, when I do get to go to Japan, I get, or I, and I go to Tokyo, the last time I went, I was with my family and uh, we stayed in Airbnb in uh, this area, which I can't even remember, somewhere, they have uh, an old, um, Olympic Training Center on one of those streets. It was right next to Yoyogi Park. And uh, it was funny because I thought, I said, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to go here. But they took the pictures of this place. We thought this place was huge. It was the size of a shoebox. And oh. there was enough room for me and my wife in one room, my daughter and my son in another room. There was They were kind of connected. And there was kind of a sitting room dining room kitchen thing there and a area that was sort of a bathroom and that, that was it that was our and we paid like you know we paid a lot of money for this but then you know when you realize that that's how much hotels cost so it was really not that bad a deal but it was it was very funny it was like you know we just sort of but they they went to uh you know we went to disney c which is the sea like i'd never been to disney i mean i've been to disneyland a couple of times in california but you just don't think about it. The Disney Sea. You go, what is Disney Sea? It's the air, the land, and the sea. And you go, <laughs> okay. So we went there, and then my my wife and daughter went to uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Hello Kitty Land. And uh, yeah, it was like it was it was like there was all the stuff. We went to see the uh, mechanical. There was a, a mechanical animals or something like this. So like uh, there was a, a show with lights and sound and really loud sound with uh, these you know fighting you know robot restaurant stuff like that which is <laughs> like it was so weird then you you go you know so, but my kids thought it was great you know they were like yeah this is awesome yeah i mean for, okay. for people for people that go to japan i always tell them like if you want to experience the wild the stuff that you see on the internet tokyo is a place to go um, and I have people sometimes contact me because of the podcast. Like, I want to go train with you. And I, I, always, I always give them a big warning. I don't live in the crazy wild part of Japan. <laughs> like, I'm, in, I'm in the countryside. You'll get a lot of rice fields. And, and that's about it. No fighting robots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it, it's funny because I, when I was, uh, you know, the, the very, very first time I was there in 77, it was just like, you go, wow, this is this is really neat. And, you know, we, we were in a, we were, you know, I was I had to go to the uh, air the air shipping place, and we had to we went there, and we I had to, you know, there was this whole bowing and scraping thing that you had to do with the customs guys so that they would let your stuff land. And so it was like I had no idea what I was saying, but I was saying a lot of it. And so yes, you know, hi 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 hi, hi and so, yes, and then and so you you'd get that, and then you'd. You'd, you know, you'd, you'd travel around and, you know, you'd, you'd get, to, you know, sometimes we would take a truck. I mean, I, it's funny, when I was in uh, in uh, Tokyo and we landed in, 
not, not Haneda, but the, um, the other airport, the big airport, whatever it is, I um, can't remember what it's called, but it's, um, but it's, it's amazing. It's so big, you know, and there's, they, they still think that there might be problems so that they, you know, there's always going to be pro progress, protests to it. And so they've, they've got this thing, this chain link fence all around it. And they've got, you know, guards that you can't get, you know, if you, you go in and if you, if you haven't done it the right thing, then they won't let you in. And, you know, even though you can get there by train, you know, you just realize that there's probably like 8 million cameras on you and, you know, they're just checking to see. And, and if, if you, if you step out of line, you know, you, you get taken into the basement room and never seen again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, well, Philip, um, we pretty much were reaching our, uh, our wrap up for the hour okay. and um and yeah you pretty much i i had a few questions already kind of in mind but you answered them all so that's oh okay that's, yeah for anybody who uh <laughs> a few things i was going to clear up uh he mentioned stefan which is stefan casting if you haven't checked out his work definitely do he's been on the pod he's been on my podcast once and um he definitely has a lot of great stuff about jujitsu and then you also mentioned um i wanted i wanted to get your 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 background story with uh with uh george st pierre but yeah yeah that, that was pretty much uh, that's that's what i really wanted to go and then one more thing i wanted to mention um he, he mentioned the kaja kembo family tree for those people that don't know what it is it's a historical record of people who practice kaja kembo who have black belts and philip yeah. is the one who runs it. one of the things i want to say that we're not supposed to like some people put their kids on there, like they're 12 year old kids. It's nice, but there's no way a 12 year old kid, I don't care how, unless he's maybe, um, you know, been your kid is, who was at 14, he got his black belt and, you know, fought later in that, that year, fought, uh, fought uh, John Natividad at the internationals and in the, for the grand championship and lost by one point, I think 12, 13 or something like that. So there are the, the unusual guys like that, but most times 14 year olds, I remember the first year I went to a tournament where they had all these kids, black belts. And it was like, cause I'm not going to say they suck because that would be an insult to their instructors, but fuck did they suck. They were really bad. You know, I mean, like they, they, it was like, you know, mommy and daddy were there and, you know, it's like, and my kid, you know, I, I remember a, 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 the person I, I went to school with actually said, you know, uh, my kids are uh, 13 and 12 and one of them is a third degree, a junior third degree and the other was a junior second degree. And you go, like, how is it possible to have a junior rank that, you know, as somebody who was like 21 or 22 would be happy to have and think that they would only have to work for like 12 or 15 years to get something like that. And meanwhile, there's some 12 year old kid who definitely didn't train, you know, doesn't train more than an hour every couple of weeks and, you know, is able to get it. I just, I'm sorry. I, anyways, anyway, so we don't, we're not supposed to have um, people under the age of 16 on there. I mean, that, that's part of the, the listing at the bottom. I, I have some rules, uh, but that doesn't stop people from putting them on. And so okay. I, you know, unfortunately, you know, I'm not going to sit there. If I know that this person isn't a black belt, I won't put them on, you know, or not a black belt. But if, they, if I know the person isn't 16, at least 16, I won't put them on. But sometimes, you know, there, you know, people, they, you know, there are a lot of us uh, out there who, who will make money from um, giving our rank, you know, giving the ranks away easier than they would have to work at them. So it's too bad it's not and i think i think you're going on a good point because um uh again like you were saying earlier it's not like you have any power or control you're just a record keeper like you you're, you're keeping record you you know you're not you're not like a gatekeeper of what's on there and i think that's what some people that uh see the family tree may or may not know um i always mention to people if you want to talk to someone about as far as they're trying to really keep track of what's going on with Kaji Kembo from a very official standpoint would be, um, ah, oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Uh, Glenn Fraticelli is a good person to talk to as far as the KSDI well, board yeah, well, and what he's, they're doing. He's now a better person, but you know, I mean, he's, you know, he's been a Kaji Kembo guy 
but you know, like all the people that are under like Dichi, uh, as as great a person as she is, has only been in it through her brother for a certain amount of time. But there's a lot of you know. It, I think what you have to do is you have to have an awful lot of independent thought, kind of like you know, it should be like a you know, like for example, medicine. Medicine is open to everybody, and so if you happen to be a doctor, you can write about stuff. And and you know, there are guys who think you know they'll they'll write about the the, the epidemic, and you, know, you have had uh, vaccination, so you know what you believe. And there are other people who go, it's fake, it's nothing, it's not real, and they go. Okay, and so the, there's no way you're going to be able to stop people who think something like that. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, you, you don't have to listen to it. <laughs> and, and, I, and I mean, what what I've been what, and there, and this is um, again, this this my podcast is about psychology and martial arts, and so lately it's a lot about martial arts. <laughs> Got to get back to the psychology somewhere along the line. I feel like the narratives are psychology, but um, that's a different story. One of the things I really have enjoyed about doing the podcast is just seeing how many Kaju Kembo practitioners are out there. Cause I had no idea. And when I started training um, when, with more organized martial arts, organ- not, not to say anything badly about Kaju Kembo, but there's some associations that are really strict and very well organized. And when I saw those associations, um, what I noticed was that, us Kaju Kimbo guys, we have something. I like how free we are, uh, men and women, guys and girls, um, how free we are to do what we want to do. And there's a lot of us. We are a huge group of people. And I feel like the family tree kind of helped me connect with some of those people. And even people that may or may not be on the family tree, I've connected with them too. And I just really enjoyed talking to people that, that, that do cause you can because there's really in the greater scheme of things, there's not that many of us when you compare us to art like judo or, or karate or, or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, or, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I've noticed within what we do. So I really do appreciate the work you do to try to bring some, some kind of organization to that, some sort of network, which has been, um, which has been nice. It's been nice. I've been able to collect a lot of awesome people through that. So. Well, Thank actually, you. <laughs> it, 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 you're very welcome. It's it, that, that, you know, I was trying to do that for me because I knew that if I was able to get these people to give me their history or a little bit of their history, it would give me the opportunity to find out if I had a connection to that. And you start realizing that, you know, like there, right now there's been a kind of a movement about all these people now who acknowledge Show and Parado as a more important teacher in their lives than Adriano and Prado. But, and, you know, I mean, in a sense, Joan Prado passed away in 1956, you know, I mean, he was within like maybe 10 years of the, uh, well, it was in eight years of the, uh, the founding of the art, you know, and people say, well, you know, we did this, you know, was it like 40, from 45 to 47, they basically, um, you know, you know, they, they went into a monastery and then fought like crazy or whatever. And then, you know, I remember like, you know, uh, like things like the, the Palama exercises, they never had katas. They never had katas. They, if you look at the, the old Kempo stuff from uh, Matosi, that stuff never existed. You know, like katas never existed. And, you know, people say, well, you know, well, how did how do they do it? Well, they just, they, they invented stuff. You know, they took the old Nihanshi stuff and they invented it. And, you know, they, they, because if you look at it, you know, the, the thing that the, the, the most amazing thing about the Japanese is their ability to make you feel smaller than you are. You know, they would have this kind of like, they'd look at you like, oh, you don't know kata. So you know real martial arts. And you go, uh, so, you know, so you, you try to do something that would put you up in their eyes and you'd realize that, hey, that's, that's a thing. You start realizing that if you start judging yourself based on somebody else, you go, what? <laughs> no, uh, to, to, to that note, to that note, to what you just said, I'm in Japan and I do Kajukembo with the kata and everything. And I still have people saying it's not a martial art. And it's because they have a certain way that they do things. And I, I, it's, it's, um, 
I've seen this. I've seen this outside of Japanese martial arts. I think I see this in, in a lot of martial arts that say things are a certain way and this is how we do it. But yeah, like even if you do have kata, uh, the Japanese have their Japanese Karate Federation. Um, I've told the story before, I think. On, yeah, I've said this before on the show. Um, I approached them. I said, hey, I want my I want some of my students. I had some kids at the time that wanted to do some tournament point sparring tournament thing. I'm like, all right, hey, I have some kids. I want to do some point sparring. How do I enter your tournament? And um, they pretty much wanted me to reteach all of their kata and reformat my kajukem would have fit their their association their international association in which i just and which just included a lot of money and i was i just said you know i i appreciate it i appreciate you and they kept telling me how lucky i am that they're making an exception for it and i just you know i appreciate you uh offering me that i'm just going to respectfully decline and i just i have my i have most of my students just fighting in um kickboxing because there's it avoids all that drama um yeah kickboxing and mma and open yeah they have open grappling tournaments the mma tournaments too which is way easier to compete in than the traditional routes that just pretty much just want money the uh, annual dues and monthly dues to just have their name i'd have the kaju kembo and i'd have to put the, probably their name over here you yeah, know and I, I don't feel like doing it <laughs> well i i i'm fortunately north america um basically was created by people who were a little bit on the other side of the, uh, the, the, the blanket, should we say, or the sheets, they, they kind of, you know, like, uh, uh, I was in Ed Parker, Ed Parker, you know, studied with, uh, with Chow, who studied with Matosi, who kind of like, yeah, and Ed, Ed Parker also studied a bit with Imperato and Imperato had his thing. And then you go like, okay, so there, you know, you just realize after a while that, you know, just because somebody, I, you know, it, it, in a sense, like people say, well, how did medicine come into being? Well, somebody decided they wanted to heal that person. So eventually, you know, whatever junk, you know, because invariably it was like, oh, the great mountain in yonder has, you know, if there's clouds above it, then you will get better. If there's sunshine, you will get, you know, like that. that's how it was all based on faith and, you know, like, oh, you know, you know, we, we, this happened, and then you, you know, eventually they came up with an understanding that if you take a bit of a, a bark from a, a willow tree, you can you can create a, a thing that you know eventually became aspirin. And so you just realizing that okay, you start replacing the things that you know with the things that worked, and you know even fighting. I mean, when you look at it, you know I hear so many people, you know, from my Kajigambo background. You know, in, in Cali background, people say, "Oh, there was no such thing. There was no such thing as Filipino martial arts." They said, "Look, the truth is, if I'm a farmer and I learned to put my stick in the ground and create a furrow and put some seeds in there, I may not have been a factory farm, but I was a farmer because I grew some I grew some fruit, or I did something, and I, I changed what I was doing." And I did this, or if I want to be a, you know, if I want to build a house, well, I have to come up with an idea of building houses. And when you have civilization, you know, and guys who, civil, who create civilization, they say, well, okay, we, we need somebody to build a, this wall for our city. So you, 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 you build, start building walls and then you become, you know, you become the go-to guy to build walls. Why? Because no one else was building walls, you know? So, I mean, all that stuff, it's like, it, it, everybody, everybody has this idea that somehow, you know, if you didn't have that in the society to begin with, then you couldn't have it later on. So, well, it's ridiculous. Imagine if we're crawling out of the trees and we're going like, hey, who wants to be a god? Who wants to be a doctor? You, you're going to be a doctor. Okay, so you, you come up with something. I got a really sore arm. So you got to come up with something to help me. Who wants to be the farmer? Okay, you got to, you got to. Put your, you know, and it's like it's, it's just stupid things like things that can't can't possibly happen. You know, like you know, you 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 you, you read stories from the old days, like you know, things like a biblical stories or Mahayana stories from the, you know the, the older cultures or the you, know, the you realize that you can see the roots of where people started doing their stuff, and it's like martial arts is no different. You know, somehow this idea that somehow martial arts have to be sprung on. You know, like if, if you look at Taekwondo. Taekwondo is 
you know, the organizational structure is basically Shotokan from the Japanese control of, of Tokyo or of Korea from, let's say, 1906 to 1945. And then they said, okay, now we're going to try to do the Tai Hyung. And they added kicks. And all of a sudden, bang, they had a different art. But before that point, it was, it was, the, it was the art that they wanted it to be. You know, it was yeah. like Shotokan. It was Shotokan. And then they said, oh, okay, we don't have to listen to them anymore. Screw Shotokan. We're going to do it. Like, well, no. You know, and so that it's, uh, you know, and then you look at, uh, you know, their uh, things in Hawaii, you know, they, you know, they had all sorts of silats that was there. And, uh, you know, I've done, there, there's a, a form called Fao Yip. And that looks to me exactly like the silat beset in Sapu. And, you know, like, and how do you do that? It's like, well, okay, so, you know, the, the Chinese sometimes create forms, you know, that they, they have so many, at a certain point in their history, they were creating forms. And so you have all these forms and, you know, this is what was used by people to do it. I mean, even, even Muay Thai, Muay Thai was, Muay Thai was, isn't something like, you know, people say, well, it's based on the, uh, the old, uh, you know, the old ancient uh, uh, you know, fighting things that from the walls. They say, well, no. Actually, that you know, they had those fighting things on the walls. Yeah, okay, but the the way that Muay Thai became popular is because the French and English sailors who were in Thailand and in in Vietnam, they would you know they would get the local guys and they would say, "Here, yeah. so we're going to teach you know you got your kicks, okay, great. So we're going to teach you some boxing, some Western boxing, and you're going to put these gloves on, but you're going to kick that crap out of each other. It's going to be hilarious." And that's what they did. Yeah, I mean, like like I said, it's it's pretty much the way I look at it is I'm just happy that I can meet other people that do Kaju Kembo. Because I can tell you from yeah. when I'm in Japan, when I talk to people that do any other art and I say I do Kaju Kembo, they have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, you don't have to Japan, you? <laughs> you can go anywhere. <laughs> Arguably, yes. <laughs> well, Philip, hey, thanks again for being on the show. Um, for my listeners, thank you so much for listening and watching Social Jello with Angelo. If you like what you saw, please subscribe. I have a podcast that I try to release twice a month. And um, I also throw in some martial arts videos and some funny videos in between. And um, I'll catch you all later. All right. Peace. Shaka shaka. Yeah. <laughs>